This is Stefan Kinsella with the Kinsella on Liberty podcast. This should be episode 077. Today is September 2nd, 2013. I'm out taking my, uh, my morning walk, which is a regular uh, exercise for me lately. <clears throat> I often walk 5 o'clock or 5.30 for an hour or two in the neighborhood just for exercise, and so uh, this is one of my podcasts where uh, I'm going to do it while I'm walking here, and um, lately most of my podcasts have just been um, interviews I've done on other people's shows, radio shows, or other forms of interviews, but I'm going to try to start doing more just uh, my own standalone content and response, partly to questions from listeners um, that I get on occasion on Facebook or by email, or in person. Um, So today I thought I would talk about something I've written a good deal about, which is the basic libertarian case for rights, and the basic libertarian uh, framework. Um, I've written about this in various places. Uh, Probably most recently would be my article... How we come to own ourselves and what libertarianism is. That that article uh, appeared in um, Hans Hermann Hoppe's Festschrift and then later on Mises Daily. They're both on my site at stephankinsella.com slash publications. Um, and scattered around in other blog posts and places are some of the things I intend to touch on here. So what I want to talk about is sort of the, the view of libertarianism that I've come to hold after thinking, researching, debating this issue for many, many, a long time. I'd say at least since 1991 um, or even earlier. <clears throat> so, over 20, 25 years. Um, my earlier writings, in the very beginning of my when I started publishing kind of academic or scholarly style, style articles on these topics, which was my estoppel theory of rights, um, which can be found on my site. One of them is called uh, something like estoppel, a new justification for rights, or a, a, punishment, a, a punishment theory in rights. Um, those articles and a lot of others, I don't disagree really. I'm actually assembling a book right now putting together a lot of what I regard as kind of my key sort of libertarian legal theory type writings. Um, Hopefully I'll finally get around to that and finish it in the next six months. And I have a publisher in mind already. (coughs) So, uh, whom I've spoken with, who's interested. So, more details on that later. But what I've noticed in assembling, starting to assemble all these articles is I do have different emphases now and some slightly different terminology now, but I rare I haven't found many cases where I disagree substantively with what, with what I've written before. Uh, it seemed to me to be largely um, consistent or of a piece, um, part of an integrated framework that all makes sense together. Uh, but for example, I would be more careful now, and I try to be more careful with how I use the word property. How I use the word state versus government, um, um, things like that. Also, even the word capitalism, which, uh, uh, at least according to some of the left libertarians, is uh, uh, is a misleading term, and at least it's one that causes us to continually get in arguments over semantics or tactics and strategy, which I find is distracting. And so I call myself an anarcho-libertarian. Or as George Casey does, a libertarian anarchist. That's, a, that's the most descriptive and least sort of controversial term, I think, except the so-called left anarchists. I don't mean left libertarian anarchists. I mean the left anarchists um, don't even think we libertarian anarchists are anarchists. But that's okay. We don't think they are either. Um, the word property, I try to be really careful in using property not to refer to the thing owned, which is a common usage, because that can lead to equivocation and to various intellectual property assumptions. 
Um, so I don't say that that thing there, that car is your property. It's not a piece of property. I would now instead try to emphasize that that scarce resource or that rivalrous scarce material object um, is your property. You have a property right in it. It's uh, something that you own or some person owns. It's something that some person has property rights in. And then our question as political theorists in general or libertarians or humans is to determine which person or entity or group of persons has the best claim <clears throat> to control that resource. Um, in other words, who should be recognized as the owner of it, which is to say who should have the property right in the thing. If you emphasize this way, then it becomes harder for the intellectual property advocate to sneak in um, this, this creationist assumption, I call it, which is that um, ideas are property. See, the question is not whether ideas are property. I'm getting to the intellectual property debate, which should not consume us much here today. This is just an example. Uh, there might be a little car noise on occasion. It's about 5 or 6 in the morning. There's not much traffic, but... Um, on occasion, a car rolls by on these dark streets here. And so, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the IP advocate is, is trying to force us to answer the question, is an idea property? Which is kind of a nonsensical question and a, a little bit question begging. The question rather should simply be, when we can identify a given scarce resource, we need to be able to answer the question, who owns it? Okay? And the libertarian set of rules and framework is designed to do just that in a particular way, which is what I'm going um, to get at in a minute here. So we don't ask, is that property? We ask, is this, is this thing a scarce resource? And if so, who has the right to control its use? Which is to say, who's its owner? Who, has a proper, who ought to have be recognized legally as having a propriety in it or a property right in it? Another one is self-ownership. Um, that term is okay as long as you're aware that it's a little bit metaphorical and it precisely ought to be regarded as body ownership. And then the question is who owns this person's body? And libertarianism <clears throat> has an answer for that as well, which is unique and different from that of other political philosophies. Um, so that's a couple of examples of how I would be careful with my terminology now um, for various reasons. But I don't really think it contradicts any of the previous things I've written. The only thing I've ever written that I uh, strongly disagree with, I would say, that I think I made a mistake on uh, would be early on a sort of an over-reliance on the Hayekian knowledge paradigm in one of my legal theory articles about the nature of law. But uh, I've since, uh, you know, adopted some different views on that, and I explained that in some subsequent articles. Um, and also maybe just some emphases. You know, I have a lot of theory in my estoppel and punishment and rights theory article about the right to retaliate, the right to punish, and I still agree with it. I think it's true. But as I wrote in subsequent articles, you know, I do personally predict and think and even prefer in some sense. I believe that in a private society there would not be much actual resort to institutionalized punishment and retaliation and retribution. Um, even though it's rightful in a sense. Um, and uh, uh, nor would there even be much resort to institutionalized use of force whatsoever, even for even for restitution purposes, I think that um, I do believe that a system of uh, ostracism along the lines used in previous quasi anarchist societies, uh, as spelled out by, say, uh, David Friedman in Machinery of Freedom and Rothbard in For a New Liberty, and most recently by Gerard Casey in his great little book, um, Libertarian Anarchy, um, and like in systems like The Law Merchant. I think that would uh, be much more um, uh, effective and cost-effective and just and humane 
for a variety of reasons. Uh, just for example, we, we, we have to recognize humans are, are not infallible. This isn't to adopt some kind of relativist stance, or, but it is the case that in almost every case of, say, criminal justice or punishment, there is the possibility of mistake. As much as we try to get rid of it, as much as we um, try to adopt burdens of proof and jury systems, there is still the chance that an innocent person is going to be wrongly convicted and actually physically killed or incarcerated. And there's just no way to undo that, especially in the case of capital punishment. Um, there's no way to undo such a, such a result. And for that reason, I think that rest, retribution and physical punishment in an institutionalized way, um, it's hard to imagine would be widespread. Um, it's hard to imagine a company that's in the business of making profit in a peaceful, future, modern, cosmopolitan, libertarian society would actually have a, a division or a wing of actual physical human beings who are employees whose job is to physically hold down people and administer, you know, a, uh, a death drug <laughs> and just kill them in cold blood, especially knowing that they might actually be committing murder if, if there had been a mistake. Um, because the cost of making the mistake would be astronomical. And um, in any case, so my point is that um, um, I think these views are consistent. The view is consistent that there is technically a right to ret retribution with also, while also believing that it wouldn't be used that much in an institutional way in society because it's just too costly in various ways. Uh, it might be used on occasion by an outraged victim's family, in which case, who knows, maybe the, um, <clears throat> maybe the victim's, um, maybe the society would turn a blind eye to that and maybe keep a wary eye on this guy who was, acted like an outlaw, but maybe they would let it go. So there would be, you know, a little bit of a background threat to being a criminal that even if Aside from the threat of ostracism from polite society, if you don't get your act straight and voluntarily agree to some kind of restitution process and uh, even a re even some kind of rehabil rehabilitation process to get yourself integrated back into society, um, there's always the threat of some rogue sort of family member uh, taking law into his own hands and maybe getting away with it, by and large. So, uh, But the point is... Um, so there are some more later nuances and things I have developed in my thinking, but so far I don't see many contradictions. Uh, even my case for intellectual property, which I think is fairly complete as I wrote it in 2000 or 2001 in the JLS, Journal of Libertarian Studies, I've written a good two dozen or so articles and hundreds of blog posts since then um, elaborating on themes and ways of explaining this point that I didn't do in that article. I do think the first article is complete but I would probably um, supplement it with more, even additional arguments and evidence. And uh, I might be a little more careful with how I use the word scarcity because everyone seizes upon this. This word scarcity um, is used in a particular way by some of us in a technical economic way to basically be synonymous with rivalrousness or rivalry. Um, but most people... You, uh, when they hear the argument, when they want to argue for IP, they sort of equivocate, and they use scarcity in the sense of uh, lack of abundance. And then they'll say things like, well, I don't know about you, but good ideas are scarce. So they're changing the meaning of the term. When we say ideas are not scarce, we mean they're not rivalrous. And I would be surprised to find any reputable economist in the world who argue that any pattern or recipe, any knowledge or information is a rivalrous resource. So they all agree it's not scarce in that sense. So you have to be careful, again, with the words, partly because it gives openings to people to engage in equivocation. So that's a little bit of preliminary thoughts. So let me explain, uh, before I get to kind of the framework I see for libertarianism. Um, 
what the sort of standard approach is and, and sort of how my thinking evolved on it and what I used to, how I used to view it. Um, I mean, most libertarians would, uh, well, there's a variety. You have your natural rights types, you have your tactical types, you have your pragmatic types and consequentialists, you have your utilitarians, you have your menarchists and your anarchists, you have your constitutionalists and your electoral politics activists. You have a variety of approaches to what we do as libertarians and what we conceive of it as being. But a large number of us basically say that it's about liberty, okay? That's why the word liberty is part of libertarianism. Uh, or freedom. We talk about freedom and liberty. Um, now, those are a little bit vague and amorphous. Most people would say they believe in liberty and freedom to some degree. Um, but you have to translate that into some sort of more concrete principles or even even legal legal precepts and legal rules that we say we're in favor of being enforced in society, whether it's by the state or by um, um, whatever legal system would emerge in a, in a free society, an anarchist society. And by the way, government and state's another one that I try to be careful of, just to take a little aside here. And again, the reason is primarily equivocation by minarchists and randians and statists of all stripes who get you to agree that we should have government. And by government, they mean what we mean by it, which is the governing civil institutions of society. Um, justice, what uh, the legal system. So we anarchists think that can be private and ought to be private and really has to be private um, for it to really fulfill its mission. Um, so just like we view roads as a independent phenomena of the state, but that the state has co-opted. We also believe law and order and what you can call government is also a private function or institution that the government, that the state, sorry, has co-opted. See, I just made the mistake myself. Um, and so people tend to think of roads, let's say, and other public functions that we're used to nowadays as being inherently uh, associated with the state. So they start interchanging these things. Same thing with government. It's inconceivable to most people that the governing institutions in society are not basically what the state is because the state has so effectively um, wormed its way into these things and taken over them uh, today. So you have to be careful with this too because the statist or the minarchist will try to get you to admit that you're in favor of law and order, which is government, and then he'll say, aha, you say you're against the government. And I'm say, we say, well, no, I said I was against the state. And they say, well, that's the same thing, you see. Well, we don't agree they're the same thing any more than we agree that roads are the same thing as a state, or roads are necessarily a state creature, although the government has taken over the function of road building and road administration by and large. So you have to be wary of that type of equivocation. So let's get back. So most libertarians would at least say that it's libertarianism about liberty and freedom, right? Now, most have a sort of dim awareness that there's something a little bit um, incomplete about this, that it requires further definition, that these terms rest upon some more, some deeper principles that they, they rely on. And that basically is property rights. It's not always recognized this way by... Uh, by libertarians, but that's what it is. Because to know what liberty you have the right to, right? to know what the freedom you have the right to, we of course have to have some conception of property rights. Because to say you have the liberty to use your body in a certain way is effectively saying this scarce resource, which is your body, um, we need to identify who the owner is. Now, the libertarian answer is you. You are the owner. Now, that's not an absolute answer. It doesn't mean the person who is associated with or inhabits, you could say, or controls that body um, or who springs from that body, however you want to put it. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not, what metaphysics you, you hold in this regard. The point is just that conceptually we can distinguish and identify the person or the self 
the legal person from the body that the person controls and uses uh, to get around in life. Um, so we would say the person himself. It's not absolute. It's a prima facie, if you will, answer, which is the legal uh, a law term meaning the first, the presumed answer, right? In other words, unless we have some reason to oppose this answer, um, that's going to be our default position. Um, so the prima facie owner of a human body is the person who is the body or controls the body. So that's the libertarian view. Now, why prima facie? Well, because uh, there can be cases where some, some other person rightfully has control of that body. There's other pla- cases where someone does not rightfully control your body, like when you're enslaved illegitimately by a slave owner, like in the case of uh, the armies of Egypt, I mean the slave armies of Egypt who built the pyramids, um, chattel slavery in pre-colonial or, or in pre-antebellum uh, America, uh, etc. Um, uh, but there are also cases where the person himself is not the legitimate owner of his body, um, and that would be if say cases where you let's say you're engaged in the, an attack on another innocent person. Uh, And then that person, we all would say, except for pacifists, extreme pacifists, which I don't regard as libertarian, at least not required by libertarianism. So in the case of such an attack, an act of aggression, one person on the body of another, the victim of the attack has the right to use force, defensive force, to repel the invasion. And that that defensive force... Uh, in, includes the right to invade the borders of the attacker, like sticking a knife into his belly <laughs> or shooting a bullet into his head or banging a club against his head or setting fire to him or something like that. Something that he doesn't, obje- he doesn't consent to explicitly, but which we regard as legitimate, even though he doesn't consent to it. So in other words, in those cases... <laughs> He doesn't have the right to control his body. So the prima facie or default right to control your body um, is rebutted in this case. So there's exceptions. The exceptions would be um, when you're committing aggression or even after you committed aggression if you believe in some forceful right to restitution or even retribution. Okay, Those are arguable, but those are examples. Um, another case would be if you sign a contract where you promise to be an indentured servant or even a slave of someone. Um, Now, I have an argument, which maybe I'll do another podcast about, where I think I agree with Rothbard and others um, that such contracts are not proper contracts. Um, They shouldn't be legally binding or legally effective for a variety of reasons. Uh, But some people, like Walter Block, do. And again, it's just an example. If you conclude that a contract is a way to alienate rights, and that's another way it could be that you don't have the right um, to um, the, to your body uh, if you've getting, gotten rid of it by some means. Another might be if you have a child or you push someone into a lake, you perform some action where you create in another person a positive obligation or a positive need from you to to take care of them or rescue them. Um, Some kind of need that is generated by your actual action. In that case, um, it could be argued, and I would argue, that the person who creates that situation now has a positive obligation to perform some action to basically take care of or help the person whom his actions have put into... um, you know, a state of need or jeopardy. Um, so if you push someone into a lake and they're drowning, you have to rescue them or try. Whereas if you just walk by a lake and see someone drowning, you have a moral obligation to rescue them, at least given the right context. Uh, or so I would argue, although that's an a-libertarian uh, view, still it's one that I hold and I think most moral, rational people would agree to, um, but you don't have a legal obligation to do it. In other words, if they drown, you're not a murderer. 
Whereas if you push someone in a lake and you fail to rescue them and they drown, you are a murderer. Uh, so those are examples of cases having children because you performed an action that gave rise to a dependent life form coming into being a, a young baby who is helpless just like a person drowning in a river is helpless. Um, so those are examples um, um, of exceptions. Okay, So you can see how – and so let's take the case of property and things other than the human body. Like let's say an apple. So I'm holding an apple, and Johnny physically snatches it from my hands and takes it. Now, did he violate my liberty or my freedom? Did he commit an act of trespass? Did he do something wrong? Did he commit an act of theft? Well, the only way to know the answer to that is to have some kind of theory of property rights and knowledge of the actual allocation of property rights. In other words... We have to ask whose apple was it. If I had just stole the apple from Johnny, and I am now holding an apple that was his apple, and I would say still is his apple, so now he still owns the apple, but I have taken possession of it from him. As the owner of the apple, he has the right to have possession when he wants it. I've separated the two by my act of coercion or aggression. Uh, oh, by the way, coercion is another word I'm careful about now. Coercion and aggression are usually used as synonyms by libertarians, but they shouldn't be, as I have a, I have a blog post about this. But um, coercion just means um, compelling someone to do something by the threat of force. But threats of force can be legitimate or they can be illegitimate, just like force is sometimes legitimate, like defensively, and sometimes it's not. It's aggression that we're opposed to as libertarians. That it's the unjustified use of force, not force in general. It's not even violence that we, we are opposed to in general. We're not opposed to violence or coercion or force as libertarians. We're opposed to the initiation of it or the aggression, the aggressive, the aggressive use, so the unjust, unjustified use of force. Um, in any case, if I had taken someone's apple from them, so I'm now possessing their apple then the owner, arguably, is entitled to use some type of force, if he can, to retrieve his apple from my hand. After all, it's his apple. But if it's my apple and he takes it from me, he's becoming the thief. So how we characterize an action as being condemned, condemnable, or justifiable depends upon a, a prior, more fundamental theory of property allocation. So my point here is that libertarians, uh, sort of as a shorthand, talk about property, um, talk about liberty and freedom. But really, to flesh these things out, you need to have, you must have some theory of property rights. Um, even though, even even if some libertarians recoil from that analysis and say things like they don't believe in self ownership. Or even body ownership. Uh, uh, some say they don't believe in property at all because it's a statist institution, all this kind of stuff. I think these are very confused analyses. Um, if you're a libertarian at all, um, I mean, I've had libertarians, uh, I, had a, I had a long discussion with Paul Gottfried, for example, who's a conservative, very conservative uh, libertarian uh, type, a uh, friend of mine. Years ago, I remember this on the bus when I visited Hoppe's annual Property and Freedom Society meeting in Bodrum, Turkey. Paul and I were having an animated discussion about this in the bus on the way to the airport. And it was a long drive, so we had a long time to talk. And, you know, he was insisting, like a kind of a conservative, that there's no such thing as rights. And this is where careful definition of terms and consistency is important in such discussions because it can become just semantic and talking in circles. Because I said, listen, Paul, do you agree that it's – let's just start from basics. It's wrong to attack an innocent person with a knife and you know stab the knife into their body and, and murder them. Do you think that's wrong? Or even to kill them. Let's just say kill. Let's not use loaded terms. He says, yes. I said, do you think that – 
um, that the victim would have, would it be legitimate if they were to use force to respond? Yes. You know, and we went through like this, and he, he agreed with me on all the details of the fleshing out of what, you, what most libertarians would call a right to life or the right to your body or, or the flip side of that. And I say flip side because remember, all obligations um, or all rights um, have a correlative obligation or duty. So if you, if, if, it, if you have a right to the physical integrity of your body... That means other people have a duty to refrain from invading it. Okay, so duties, and this is why libertarians generally oppose positive rights, because they would imply positive obligations. And except in cases where you voluntarily incur such a positive obligation, as in the examples I gave earlier, um, of creating it by pushing someone into a lake or creating a new life form, uh, we generally oppose positive rights... And by this I mean like welfare rights, because all rights have a correlative duty or obligation. In the case of what we call negative rights, you know, the right to be left alone, the right to have someone not invade our property or our bodies. Again, you see I use the word property in the sort of sloppy way. I should say invade resources that we have, re have homesteaded or come to own. Um then okay sorry I had to pause there I was going to cross the street anyway so the point is we have to have a, a property theory um, to flesh out what it means to have freedom and rights and all this and so my point was in the Gottfried example you know, he basically admitted everything that constitutes what we call rights but he just didn't want to use the word right to discover it um, and I've had this conversation with other people I say listen just because you say you don't want to use the word rights doesn't mean we're, you don't agree with me on what I'm, I'm calling rights. I don't really care if your only objection is that you don't like the word we're using. Like, I had a discussion with someone the other day who says he's an anarcho-capitalist, but he doesn't like to use the word libertarian. And to my mind, it's, it's like, it doesn't matter if you don't like to use it. You know, it's a question of definition. What does libertarian mean? And if you define libertarian the way which is, I think, justified and commonly, which complies with the common usage of the term, um, then anarcho-capitalists or anarcho-libertarians are just a subset, one type of libertarian. So his mistake was thinking, if you say you're a libertarian, you're associating yourself with minarchists. And I'm like, well, no. I mean, you're a human too. Some libertarians, some humans are libertarians, and some are not. Some humans are anarcho capitalists, and some are not. And so you're an anarcho capitalist type of human. It doesn't mean you're not a human. And it doesn't mean that if you say you're a human, that you're associating yourself with humans that are murderers or whatever. So it's just a confusion. Uh, so is the resistance to the word rights. I think a lot of the resistance to the word rights comes from um, people that are skeptical, for example, of the way it's been used by certain certain um, th thinkers or groups. Uh, for example, some are leery of the idea of natural law for various reasons, but one might be, you know, it's been used by, say, the church, the Catholic church, uh, in ridiculous ways, like you know, to oppose the use of uh, birth control. Uh, now, you can have your own moral views on that, but it's got nothing to do with natural rights. It might be an, a type of natural law theory, but it's not the same as natural rights. Um, especially in the libertarian, western, radical, sort of Lockean English tradition. Okay, so... So, the concepts of property rights and rights are inescapable when we, get, when we get to talking about these things. People can disagree on the details on how it's to be applied, what rights people have, what property rights there are, etc. But really, that's what they're debating about. Even a socialist and a libertarian are always debating over property rights in scarce resources. There's just no way around that. Okay, so... The bare terms liberty won't suffice. Um, 
So what emerged from this? So then theorists uh, like Rothbard, let's say, Rothbard pointed out that all rights are property rights. Now, the nub of his insight there, which he didn't flesh out in great detail, was something Hans Hermann Hoppe has fleshed out in greater detail, sort of in the footsteps of uh, Mises and, and Rothbard combined, plus insights from other philosophers like uh, Habermas and Hume and Carl Otto Appel. Uh, and I would recommend in particular chapters one and two. They're very short but extremely packed with insights um, of his theory of socialism and capitalism, which is available uh, online at his site, hanshoppe.com. So look at chapters one and two of Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, where he emphasizes the importance of the, the, the role of scarcity or rivalrousness in the very uh, origins and nature of any property system. Okay, so um, what Rothbard says is that all rights are property rights. Now, why does he say this? Because he's recognizing that when you talk about a right, you're really always talking about the right to control something. Of course, the right to control something is the right to control some physical, scarce, material resource that people can dispute over. Okay? Now, the sort of first... um, The first level assumption of how to look at um, these things, and what a a lot of libertarians say is that everything goes back to the homesteading principle. Now, what is this? This is sort of the proto-libertarian view of John Locke, an important um, English political theorist from the 1600s. And Locke argued that he's got his famous argument, which is repeated and analyzed still to this day by libertarians. Uh, His argument was that the world is given to mankind in common by God. But what that means is that there are parts of the world that is the natural set of resources in the world, which is scarce resources, um, that have not yet been appropriated by someone. So you you could say they're in the commons. Now his predecessor, Filmer, would argue that means that they were under the kind of quasi ownership or of, of, of Adam, basically, and, and, the, and the feudal monarchical classes that trace their title back to Adam, the first guy. So we have a feudalistic sort of society justified by this type of idea that the world was given in common to mankind, and therefore the first guy, Adam, owns everything. So he's sort of like a king having, um, you know, the base ownership of all property, and then he allocates it out to different vassals and lords and down to the surf level, and they all have their order. So it was used by Filmer to justify the feudal order in in Europe. Um, Locke basically treated that common as saying that things were effectively unowned. Now, regarding it as a commons gave him a little problem in his theory. It led to his Lockean proviso, which I may have time to get to, which libertarians, uh, at least the radical ones of my stripe meaning people like Rothbard, I believe, and me, and Hoppe, and Anthony de Jasse, for example, de Jasse, reject the Lockean proviso, which says that you can homestead unowned resources, but only so long as there's enough and is good left for other people. I believe that, that theory is a remnant of, um, of, the, of this mistaken Filmarian way of looking at it. Instead of looking at the world of unknown resources as having been given in common to mankind by God with, say, certain strings attached as to how you use it, it's better just to look at them as unowned resources, whether given to us by God or not, but they're just unowned resources. And that's a more Austrian, Austrian approach as well. Because remember, the Austrian approach is a subjective, uh, believes in subjective values, the appropriate way to understand uh, human value and human action. And so, uh, as Hoppe has written in some of his pieces, this means that the characteristic of what we call a good, an economic good, depends upon its subjective, its being subjectively regarded as such by an actor. So whether something is a capital good or a consumer good or a good at all depends upon the way it's regarded 
subjectively by the actor who intends to employ that that resource in some manner. If you intend to employ it for consumption, it's a consumer good, etc. So there's no intrinsic qualities in goods themselves. Um, there are relational qualities uh, based upon the intended use for a human being, which is not subjectivism in the Randian sense of basically relativism or skepticism. It's just recognizing that humans or subjects are the valuers. By the way, Rand's view of value is compatible with that of Mises' subjectivism because she says that a value is something that a man acts to gain and or keep. She put the word act in there on purpose. You have to act to try to achieve it. And that's exactly what Mises is getting at with his idea of demonstrated preference, which is basically the idea that Values are subjective because of some subject, some actor, uh, indicates or demonstrates that he values something if he, if he acts to try to use it as a means or to achieve it as an end of action. Anyway, that's a little digression. But the point is, Locke had this idea that God gave the world to human, humankind in general. But some, of it's, some of it has been used and claimed, some of it is not. That which hasn't is unowned. That which is, um, well, let's save that for a second. And, and also, he distinguishes human bodies, and so he says that uh, is you know everyone has a propriety in himself, which means it's proper for the person himself to be the one that has the right to control his body, which is another way of saying self ownership uh, or body ownership, you could say. So the Lockean idea is that you have these human beings who are self-owners because of the gift of the grace of God or the gift of God, and that these self-owners um, can then appropriate out of the state of nature, that is, out of the commons, that means out of the unowned state of things, resources by mixing their labor with them. And this is called homesteading. So, you know, you could establish a homestead. You could go find a virgin territory and find a good place for a farm, build a fence around it, have some cows, chickens, you know, uh, a water mill maybe, uh, a barn, pasture, um, and, a, and a log cabin somewhere where you can you know, live and sleep, uh, a garden, that kind of thing. So you basically transform this unowned resource, you take it out of the commons and make it yours. Now, most libertarians use that basic metaphor or idea, and when they try to systematize their views, they start recognizing everything's a property right, as Rothbard says, and they say, um, so everything's about homesteading. So they'll say something like, well, yeah, you homestead not only unowned resources out there in the world, but you first become a self-owner by homesteading your body. Now, this is the first mistake I think a lot of libertarians make. It's an honest mistake, but it leads to confusion because it's mixing up things. Um, I think it's wrong to say we homestead our bodies, and I'm not even sure Locke would have said that. I think Locke sort of treated bodies differently than he treated other resources, which I would call homesteadable resources, which I would say previously unowned resources. Something that is unowned is subject to appropriation or use or homesteading. Subject to some acting human being coming in and employing that as a means, setting up a boundary around it or a border, and demonstrating that he is now the owner of that thing. Okay, You can see how actors and the things actors acquire are distinct. You couldn't the very idea of homesteading an unowned resource presupposes that there is an actor. But an actor is not a ghost. It's not a disembodied thing. It's not a soul just wandering around looking for things to homestead. You can't imagine an invisible, immaterial ghost homesteading a tract of land. No, it's a human being with a body. So it makes no sense to talk about homesteading bodies because there's no homesteading agent in existence before there is a human being with a body. And this was something I've tried to draw out in some of my writing in the How We Come to Own Ourselves article. 
which I think is compatible with uh, parts of Rothbard's writing and parts of Locke, and specifically with with with, Locke, with Hans Hermann Hoppe's writing. Um, I had to find some of it in the original German, which wasn't easy since I don't speak German. But if you see that article, you'll see that he had already kind of figured this out, although some of it he had not called uh, attention to in all of his writing in English. But in any case, um, so the framework that I came to, which I think is compatible with a more um, consistent and elaborated and kind of clarified Lockean vision, ultimately, and Rothbardian as well, is is that we just we have to treat bodies and um, other resources distinctly. Which, by the way, is why I think that Walter Block is wrong in his idea that um, uh, we can sell ourselves into slavery. Because when he that argument just uh, um, uh, omits the differences between bodies and other types of resources. There are there are relevant differences. So I'm getting down to the way I view the libertarian framework is that it's very simple. We look around in the world, those of us who are trying or in favor of trying to live peacefully with each other, live good lives ourselves, and we're also generally people of goodwill and empathy. We want other people to do well as well, and if we're intelligent, know a little bit about the division of labor and economics and just human social nature itself, we realize that we're all better off if we all can survive and trade with each other and live with each other cooperatively. So there's good reason for people of goodwill, rational, healthy, psychologically healthy humans living in the world to want to band together in society to want their own lives to be prosperous and successful and to flourish, but also our neighbors. These types of people who generally have language and are rational, they communicate and they argue, they discuss things, they try to justify things, they believe in norms, they adopt norms, norms that are useful as guides to action to help solve practical problems that might arise in human society, problems of conflict. Remember, ultimately, all conflicts, all problems that could possibly occupy human time or really always conflicts over who gets to control a given scarce resource, which kind of gets back to Rothbard's insight that all rights are property rights. Um, Let me give an example. People say that um, sometimes people fight over religion. Well... I don't think that's actually literally or technically true. That's, in, that's not a precise way of putting it. It's a more of a metaphor. And again, metaphors get you into trouble if you're not careful. What they're really saying in sort of a flower, a colorful language or imprecise language, they're saying that the motivation, okay, or the, the ultimate reason for certain people's actions is a religious one. So, for example, if some barbarian chops off the head, not a barbarian, let's say, some, 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 uh, I don't want to go and pick, pick religions here, let's say religions A and B, okay, if a person of religion A chops off the head of a person of religious B, religion B, um, to, com- because he wouldn't, because the second person would not convert to the first person's religion, then we could say they're fighting over religion, but really what they were fighting over was the head of person B. Who got? Who has? The, who really has the right to control the body of person B? Is it B or is it A? Now A thinks A can control it. Now he has a reason for that. It's a reason may be religious. Okay, and person B thinks he's the one who should have the right to control his body. He may or may not have a reason for that. Maybe it's just intuitive or natural, or maybe he has no theory at all. But we libertarians have an opinion on this. And our opinion is that B, as a self-owner, or as the owner of his body, has the right to control his body. Okay? So my point is, all disputes are always necessarily, all disputes in human life that need political rules or legal rules to, uh, 
to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to respond to these problems, there are always conflicts over scarce resources, or what we call rivalrous resources. Okay? So once you realize that, things become clearer. Like this IP issue doesn't even arise. We don't say, who is the owner of that idea? Because the natural answer might be, well, who created it? All right? Once, because that whole way of looking at it overlooks a, a crucial step, which was, wait a second. We're trying to come up with rules to settle disputes. Disputes are disputes over scarce resources. So what's the scarce resource at issue here that we, we are trying to decide who the owner is? Right? And if you just talk about who owns the idea, you're, side, you're, you're skipping over that step. You're just making the implicit assumption without calling it to someone's attention. You're making the implicit assumption that ideas are types of things that exist in the world that are similar in some respect to other things in the world that we can own. So, you know, there are wheelbarrows and there are bales of hay and there are clubs and there are log cabins and there are tracts of land and human bodies. These are all things. Yeah, but so is an idea. So is a poem. So is a recipe for, for making a cake. These are all just types of things in the world. And just as one type of thing can be owned, the others can be owned. This is the argument of people like Tibor McCann, uh, who's a um, neo-objectivist libertarian philosopher who brings in the concept of ontology, which is the philosophy of the study of the types of things that actually exist in the world. And to me, it's just a confused way of tr trying to say that, hey, you believe that you can have property rights in rocks and trees. Well, there's other types of things ontologically in the universe, like poems and manuscripts and novels and movies and songs and inventions and paintings. So why can't these things be owned too? And once you grant that they are things that can be owned... Well, the question naturally arises, who is the best person who has the best claim to that thing? In the case of scarce resources, the answer is always whoever used it first. Remember, we're talking about unowned things. The first person who appropriates it out of the wilderness and puts his stamp of personality on it, which is another way of saying he puts up a fence or a border to show that it's his, to show that it's no longer unowned. He now has a better claim than anyone else who Hoppe calls a latecomer. So the rule is basically who first used it. Now we can have exceptions to this rule. If the owner of a thing, and by thing I'm talking about a scarce resource, a material object. If the owner of that thing contractually gives it to someone else, well now the second person has a better claim than the first person. Okay? Okay. So that would be a case where the, the homesteader doesn't own the thing. He used to own it, but then he voluntarily parted with ownership of it by giving it to another person, by some, by some action where he made clear that his, his, um, his ownership is ceasing because he no longer intends to own it as owner. He only merely possesses it so, so long as he needs to, to transfer the right to own to the recipient of his contractual transfer. Um, you could think of other cases too. Again, a case of crime or tort where you do something to someone that gives you an obligation to pay them money or some kind of damages to make up to them the harm you've done to them. In that case, maybe you lose the property rights you had in something that you originally owned but now is subject to a claim by them for restitution. But other than exceptions like this, contract or restitution for some, which are both voluntary acts by the owner, um, we can always trace the owner of a given disputed resource by a combination of a, a few simple rules. The first would be the Lockean appropriation or homesteading rule, which means we find out who has the earliest known claim to this resource. Okay, could be the first guy or it could be just the earliest guy known to history. Um, or who received it from someone who owned it by contract or some other claim like restitution. Okay, so that's how we answer the question. 
we always identify the scarce resource that's in dispute, and we have an answer to it based upon libertarian principles. Okay, So people who just talk about what property is, they are engaged in the kind of a, a, um, a sleight of hand, right? They're shifting the, the debate and they're injecting a lot of assumptions. Uh, we don't ask, the question is not what is property. So the question is not our idea is property. The question is what's the dispute about here? What do you really want and who has a better claim to it? So let's take an IP dispute. So A and B live in a community together, and uh, A comes up with a way to um, build his log cabin with a new technique of interlocking joists or something that makes it more stable um, in strong winds so it doesn't get blown down as easily. I don't know. Or maybe he covers it with a certain um, substance he finds in some trees that, that, that makes it less likely to burn down in a fire. I don't know. Whatever. He comes up with some way to use his resources. I was going to say his property, but we don't want to say property. Let's just say he finds a way to use the resources that he has a property right in. Now, later on, his neighbor B starts using a similar technique to construct his house. He coats it the same way. He builds it with interlocking joists to make it stronger. Now, maybe he came up with this idea on its own, or maybe he saw A doing it and learned from what A was doing in public and emulated A. In either case, A might get indignant and say, you stole my idea. Um, I want you to stop unless you pay me tribute. You pay me five sheep a month, and I'll allow you to keep using your house built with my idea. And B is just minding his own business and thinking, what the hell? This guy's a, um, a busybody, and he's kind of a crook, too. He's trying to take my property from me. Again, I'm using property colloquially. He's trying to take my stuff from me. What's he trying to take from him? Well, A is really asserting the right to control B's log cabin or B's sheep, right? He wants some of B's sheep in tribute, or he wants B to stop using his own logs in his own house in a certain way. Now, that is the claim of an owner. B is basically claiming ownership of A's resources, A's body, A's home, A's logs, A's sheep, A's farm, A's patrimony. So that's really what's going on here, just like in the religion case where you know, the fight's not really over religion. That's just a way to describe the motivations of the people that are fighting. But what they're really fighting over is, is the physical land and physical resources and the physical bodies of the people that they're using weapons against and using, uh, that they're attacking with their armies and their hordes. Okay? Same thing here. What A is really asking for is he wants some kind of judicial body, some kind of institutionalized justice procedure, or maybe he's going to just be um, a vigilante and do it on his own. I don't know. But the point is, what he's effectively claiming is a property right, the right to own, the right to control B's body, B's house, B's sheep. Now, so the question is, is that a legitimate claim? Does he have a claim to these things? Now, if we're a libertarian, you go back to the libertarian, very simple rules. And you say, well, let's think about it. Who owns, who should we assign property rights to these resources in? Who really has a better claim to it? Well, B... Sorry, I had an interruption there. In any case, uh, uh, back to my... Uh, Back to my recording. The, the point is, um, B, uh, we know that B is the one who homesteaded the logs. He's the one who plucked the logs from their unknown state in the wilderness. And he's the one who grew the sheep on his land. And he's the one who controls his body. 
So he has a presumptive or prima facie right to these things under standard libertarian Lockean principles. How could A possibly have a claim in these things? Well, the only way is if B has, number one, contractually somehow agreed to give these things to, um, to A, or if B has somehow committed a tort or a crime against A, which means invading the borders of A's property, you know, committing a crime against A, A's body or something like that. But there's no allegation here that that's happened. It's simply that A doesn't like B using his property in a certain way. That certain way being something similar to how A is using his property. Even if A learned of it first, and even if B observed and imitated and learned from you know, A's innovation, uh, that's basically what A doesn't like. So A's using his dislike of how B's using his property as an excuse or justification to take property or resources that, own, that are legitimately owned by a second person. So you can see how the standard, which, which by the way is obviously illegitimate. So my point is that A obviously has no case whatsoever. If he asserted this anywhere, he should be regarded as laughed out of court, and if he tries to act on it with force, he should be regarded as an invader and repelled with force. And A and B should be able to sell his sheep as his own sheep and use his house as he sees fit. So, that is the basic libertarian paradigm. The libertarian paradigm is that we first have a property rule for ownership of bodies, which is that each person owns his body, prima facie, and that, bo- that human, human being, that actor with a body, having a body, acting in, the, acting in the world, employs various scarce means by first using them or by acquiring them by contract from a previous owner. And that's it. It's pretty simple, really, once you look at these principles. Um, so the libertarian project, or projet, we might say in French, the Libertarian Project project is always identify a given disputed scarce resource that's being disputed or claimed as ownership by more than one person, and we dissolve, we, we determine which of those claimants has the better claim to it in accordance with very basic rules, self-ownership, homesteading, contract, and tort law. And uh, the application can be complicated in some cases, um, but you can see how it solves right away a lot of problems like intellectual property. There's just no room for intellectual property when you have such an analysis. In any case, I think that's enough for today. I'm going to finish my walk and uh, maybe do another one of these next week. Listeners can feel free to email questions or post comments on the, uh, the blog post about this. Thanks.